There is one quite serious problem, of course, which develops when one attempts to apply experimental or so-called way out techniques to science fiction. Many people in science fiction are excellent on science and not so good on the literary side. I'd like to see us go back to the original meaning of the word masterpiece. It was the piece of work which an apprentice had to produce at the end of his time in order to prove to his teachers that he was a complete master of the techniques of his speciality and was fit to go out and teach them to other people. After that, he was free to go and do his own thing. And in connection with what's been so often termed the new wave in science fiction, I'd like to underline one extremely important point. Before one breaks the rules in a field where giants have walked, one must know why those rules were created in the first place. The example which I usually adduce is to say that if it were not for the fact that Picasso was one of the half dozen great portrait painters of his generation, he could never have become the seminal influence which he is on modern art. I myself have tried to adopt this particular posture in my own work. I find, as I said at the beginning, no discontinuity in my own mind between the various types of things that I do. I've written novels like Stand on Zanzibar and The Jagged Orbit, which involve some quite unconventional narrative techniques. And yet, I would not claim that these are particularly new. They are adaptations. I would further say that I have shown, in some sense, I can do the standard narrative bit standing on my head. In fact, I go to these more exotic narrative techniques primarily in order to make points which simply cannot be made in any other way in my estimation. A book like Double Double, which is an updated horror story. Uh, a book like Time Scoop, which is an, I suppose, a kind of science fiction black comedy belongs to me in the same continuum of my work as do the more literarily ambitious and pyrotechnical novels such as Stand on Zanzibar. I find, therefore, that the term new wave is basically an optical illusion. The style one adopts, presumably, is the one which is best adapted to the material one is working with. But I stress, before breaking rules, one must, absolutely must, understand why those rules were made in the first place. Otherwise, there is a tremendous risk of confusing and even losing the reader. Let me again refer to my own experience vis-a-vis -vis the audience for science fiction. There was a time when, if I went to a party and with a stranger, I got into the usual what-do-you-do, what-do-you-do routine, and I said, I write, and she said, um, it could be a he, but it was usually due to trying to chat up an attractive bird. Uh, she said, really, what kind of thing do you write? I'd say, mostly science fiction. There would be one of two responses. Either she'd say, oh, groovy, I read a lot of science fiction, I never met anybody who wrote it before, which would be fine, or else there would be a dead pause, and she'd say, oh, I don't read much science fiction, I'm afraid. But that, I think, has changed. Because now, the response is far more likely to be, oh, groovy, I saw 2001. Or possibly the Andromeda strain, or something of that kind. And I must say that this is very much of a conversation stopper. Because on this basis, the person in question almost invariably thinks that he or she knows all there is to be known about science fiction. And this is a terribly false impression. In fact, science fiction is infinitely wider than most people's preconception of it, and it's an integral part of the spect spectrum of fiction. As I've already said, it makes far better sense to view the continuity of the audience for tales of wonder, marvel tales, whatever you call them, than it does to try and trace a direct literary genealogy for the writers of the present day. Similarly, living as we do in a world which is likely to change out of recognition while our backs are turned, we should not be surprised to find that 
Visitors from another star system feature prominently in Slaughterhouse-Five by Kurt Vonnegut. We should not be at all surprised to find that what were known as cyborgs a few years ago in the pulp science fiction magazines turn up in novels like John Hersey's The Child Buyer. And equally, we should not in the least be astonished to discover that somebody like Philip K. Dick in The Man in the High Castle has taken the full range of contemporary formal narrative structure and applied it to a world in which history turned out totally different from what it did in real life. If you're not familiar with The Man in the High Castle, I should indicate that it is set in a world where the Axis powers conquered the United States. Well, these rather brief indications, I think, could be summed up by saying that so long as there is an overlap for the audience of various types of fiction, one cannot possibly hope to create a definition of science fiction, pure and simple, which is any more exclusive than the traditional rainstorm. For me, this is a very good thing indeed. I come to science fiction conventions, I travel to many countries, meet science fiction readers, who speak diverse languages, who've read my books in Italian or Portuguese or German or Swedish. And one factor remains constant. I get feedback. I would far rather have feedback from people whose horizons are not limited by reading nothing but science fiction. It impresses me a great deal more if the person who has just said I liked such and such a book of mine, then proceeds to discuss poetry or the novel in general, or a question of history, or a question of politics, than if the person then proceeds to discuss nothing else but the work of my fellow science fiction writers. I'm a great believer in broadening horizons to the maximum possible. And I have learned the hard way that it is literally out of the question for a science fiction writer to imagine anything more extraordinary than what is bound to appear in tomorrow morning's paper. I hope very much that under the impact of the growing interchange between category science fiction and mainstream fiction, the walls of what Dale Mullen called the science fiction ghetto will finally be eroded away for good and all. Because I like to go wherever my imagination takes me. We do, let's face it, live in a world which to our grandparents, even to our parents, would be impossibly fantastic. And yet our present and our past coexist to a degree which has never been possible before in history. Oh, for goodness sake, what would Geoffrey Chaucer have thought if he'd known that his Canterbury Tales were going to become a long-running musical play? Our present and our past overlap, and so too does our future. And it's been very rightly said, it behooves us all to be interested in the future because that is where we're going to spend the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm.